Hey there. Well, we're in between storms here out in the uh, East Coast. It's started raining and I've had a couple of power outages today. So let's, between power outages, shoot a video. Here we have an old Navy receiver. This is called an RG. And it, of course, in keeping with my collecting interests, is from the interbellum, the time between World War I and World War II. Now, the RG is kind of important in the big scheme of things for the U.S. Navy in that it was the more or less first, uh, first receiver, HF receiver, that really got out into the fleet in pretty good numbers. They were used on shore stations, of course, as well. But before, before the RG came out, eh, the Navy was still kind of stuck with VLF, LF, and uh, medium frequency receivers. So this, this new high frequencies up into the megahertz, it was something new to them. Now, this is, like I said, an RG, a successful design. This one dates from, I think, about 1927 or 1928, and uh, it was a successful design. There was an RG, an RG1, an RG2, and an RG3. The RG3 came out in, I think, the very early 30s, maybe 32 or 1933. So this RG proved its, its, its worth out, out in the fleet. So, well, they figured, let's stick to this design and uh, keep making it. Now, yes, eventually it was pretty obsolete because, remember, radio technology was really moving fast uh, in between the wars, especially especially in the 20s. So, uh, yes, the, the, the RGs sailored on, so to speak. I think... A few of them still may have been in service in World War II, but for the most part, they were in the backwaters of the Navy, maybe maybe stuck down in Radio 3, where, you know, the backup, backup, backup receiver, but for a time, they were the thing. So let's take a look at this. This guy here, I purchased a long time ago. I got this from the Muckow auction. Now, old radio, old radio collectors, mm, that might ring a bell. Old Doc Muckow in Elgin, Illinois. Down, uh, I used to live in Illinois, and I remember going to the auction, and cripes, was I still in college? I don't know. It was a million years ago. And uh, there were a few things I really wanted, and I saved up my money. This was one of the things I really wanted, and sure enough, I did get it. Now, I spent a lot of money. I think I spent $1,000 for this, which was a huge amount of money for me. But, hey, it's a pretty great thing. So, like I said, let's look at it. It is a basic regenerative receiver. As you can see, it's split into two chassis. The, uh, the overall unit here is called an SE2514 and then uh, the uh, this side which is the tuned RF amplifier is the 2512 and the uh, audio frequency amplifier is the uh, 2511 they are two independent pieces however they you pretty much use them together and uh, yes just like that Clap Eastman receiver that I did a couple months back, this is a regenerative design. That means that basically you have an oscillator that is sitting right at the edge of oscillation. You can tune your oscillator to be just where you want it to be, where you're just barely picking up a station, it wants to break into oscillation, you might do it, you might not. You have to ride that rail really closely. If you do it right, a regen receiver can be extremely sensitive. So that's basically what this part is. 
This other half here is basically just an amplifier. Um, you you do have uh, they do work together, of course, because you can see. Yes, this is this is just tuning here, and your regenerative control is over here. So when you tune something in, you basically have to ride the regen control and get things just right. Now, unlike that clap Eastman, they actually did give you a little button below, and you probably can't really see it here, but it's the oscillator test button. And that lets you know if your oscillator is breaking into oscillation or not. Just a kind of handy thing to have around. So uh, let's go over some of the other controls here. You can see we've got a couple of meters here and the filament rheostats here. You have to set your, uh, set your filaments just right. Now, if you look, in fact, I'm going to draw, bring this receiver a little closer because if you look at the meter, you'll see that there, first of all, there's a little button here. You push this little button here. That will uh, allow you to test your filament. Now, if you look closely, you can see there's a red, white, blue, almost looks like a flag, almost looks like a French flag or something like that right there in the middle of the meter. That's when you test your, your uh, uh, when you do the filament test, what you want to do is match up the, the meter needle to the red, white, or blue section, depending on what type of tubes you have in there. Now, this does use Western Electric peanut tubes, and we'll show that in a minute. But those early tubes were extremely variable in quality. So one of the variables, of course, was how well they, well, how well they worked, basically. So Western Electric would, would paint the tips of the tubes in sort of a grading system. So if you had blue-tipped tubes, and they had a little bit of blue lacquer on the tip, you tuned it in, you turned that filament control into the blue area. If it had red lacquer on the tip, you uh, tuned it into that red area. Now, presumably, yes, you had to have all the same type of tubes. So uh, this has four tubes, one tube here, three tubes here, and I'll show that in a minute. Uh, presumably, you had to keep all the, the, the tubes kind of the same color, I suppose. In the amplifier section here, if you got red, if you have one red tube, the other tubes better be red tipped. I don't think you could you could mix and match them and really get it to work properly. So uh, yeah, very simple design here. Basically, you have a tuner, and then you have an amplifier. Not much to it. Uh, some of the other controls here is well, not much actually. You could actually uh, take the tuner in and out of circuit. I believe that's what this control is for. And also over here, you could take various stages of the amplifier out of circuit. Hey, if you didn't need a second RF amplifier, <laughs> don't use it. <laughs> Why they did this, um, I think it was, it was rudimentary volume control. And also, these were battery sets. So... In times of emergency, you might not want to keep, uh, have um, all, all your tubes running uh, if you really needed to conserve power. So I think you could actually cut out some of the tubes to conserve your battery. So let's take a look at the inside here. Now, unlike the Clap Eastman from before, this thing is made for service it is it is someone was thinking here the, uh, the manufacturer of course was Nesco National Electric Supply Company that is not the national that made the HROs it's a different company Nesco was a big contractor back in the World War One uh, just up to World War two then they kind of faded away they never went away completely but they, uh, they were not the star they used to be. All right, so what we have here 
We have one tube in the tuner here, and these are Western Electric peanut tubes, so to speak, peanut tubes. This is a CW1344, uh, uh, and uh, more, more well known as the Western Electric 215A peanut tube. This is the, uh, the tuning coil for the RF amp, and you can see here. And uh, yes, they did give you a whole bunch of of tuning coils. There's a box, and in fact, I do have the box. However, I'm not going to show it because well, it's just a box, and it contains the coils. And oh yes, you can uh, if you really want to. You know, you don't have to take the uh, you don't have to take the uh, chassis out to get to the coils. They do give you hatches on top, which is kind of nice. But they they gave a lot of detail to this. Check out the the nice. I don't know what these things are called, but the nice cast aluminum pieces here that allow you to put the chassis down and not bend stuff up. Very handy. The parts are, the components are all first rate. We have a nice Cardwell capacitor down there. Everything is just really nicely done. And uh, you can see here that slips in, you have these nice leaf contacts here a bit of a filter assembly here the uh, um, the uh, some of the inputs are right here again with some leaf contacts nice aluminum case yeah this was a very high-end high-end receiver for the time get that back in there here we have the other section. You can see the three tubes. We like said three stages, and of course you have the receiving coil here. You have to use the uh, the two coils as a pair, and you can see this one's in red ink and receiver coil one. This is uh, one kilohertz to twenty one fifty kilohertz, and yes, it is serial number matched. And uh, I do have the entire coil set. And like I said, the box too, but I'm not going to show the box. Like I said, it's just a box. But uh, yes, if you wanted to change bands, you had to open the hatches. Harder to do when the thing's not in, the, when the uh, chassis's not in. But you had to open the hatch, change both coils over. There was no band switch, no. You had to manually change the coils over. But yes, this is pretty much your kind of standard amplifier. You see nice, nice transformers there. And once again, very high quality. Now you will notice here that this is kind of uh, loose, isn't it? Well, originally this was on rubber shock mounts. And the rubber has just disintegrated. It, it's... In today's world, uh, on my shelf or on my bench or wherever, it doesn't make a difference. But when you're on a ship and the waves are rolling, maybe the guns are firing, motors are running. Ships are very noisy, vibrating spaces, <laughs> places. And um, you will have microphone 215s are horribly microphonic. So... They did think about giving some shock mounting to the tubes to cut down a little bit on the microphonics. But yeah, you can see all the first-rate parts. First-rate parts. Now, I have tried this thing out. And uh, I actually took it to one of the MRCG shows. Uh, uh, one of the shows down in Los Angeles. This was quite a few years ago. And uh, we couldn't get this thing to talk. We couldn't get this thing to make much noise at all, even though there's a, a big Clear, clear Channel's AM station in, uh, in L.A. That's why this has the, uh, the, the AM broadcast coils in it. It does actually go up to, oh, I want to say about 15 kilohertz, or 15 megahertz, however, I don't know how well it works up there. But uh, certainly these things were, were well used in the, you know, the, the four and five and six and eight uh, megahertz range. It, pushed, it was probably pushing it to get up to 15. 
But I brought the AM coils because I figured, hey, we'll be able to hear something. And we just couldn't. And we probed around and we couldn't find any problem with this. The tubes seemed fine. We could swap around the tubes. Nothing really changed. We looked at the transformers. We buzzed them out because those old audio transformers are infamous for going open. They have such fine wire and manufacturing just wasn't quite right on those. So 1920s audio transformers, they are more, more, more often bad than not. But these are good. However, we just couldn't get this thing to work. Don't know why. <laughs> I'll give it another shot. You know, I, I, I realize this is not going to be a, a... This this ain't no R390. <laughs> but um, it, we should be able to at least get a, a nice clear channel AM, uh, AM station. And, uh, of course, yes, this covers a couple of the hand bands. So, yes, on uh, 160, 80, 40 meters should work should work just fine but well it's got some issues so anyway yeah this uh this is the navy rg from national electrical supply nesco kind of mid late 1920s and kind of an important set and uh i do i do like this a lot i really like this look there it, it's a similar look to some of the other Navy receivers of the time, the RE and the RF, and there were a few others, but the RE, RF, RG were kind of this, this trio that uh, spanned the very low frequencies all the way up to HF, and uh, were very successful designs. There were a few other HF receivers the Navy had after this. There was a submarine version, I think it was for the submarines, called RO. Don't have much information at all about that. And I'd certainly like to find, I'd like to find an RO, but I'd certainly like to find any information on it. By the mid-30s, HF was really starting to take hold, and there were a number of designs and, uh, well, some of them were extremely successful, like the R-A-K-R-A-L, R-A-L is actually the HF, uh, HF version of the set, but that was quite the success. But this RG, well, it, 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 it held its spot for, well, a good, what, eight years or so? And even a little bit of, a little bit further in the, maybe not as important parts of the U.S. Navy. Anyway, hope you like this uh, this video. Had uh, had a chance to make one, being that they had power outages, and I figured, you know what, I can't get much work done here with it's going back up and down. So why not make a video? Alrighty, I'll talk to you later. If you have any questions or comments on this RG or anything else, let me know. Eventually, I want to track down what's wrong with this. I'm just stumped. And even some of the guys at the show back at, at the MRCG show back, well, some years ago, stumped. Didn't know what was actually going on with this thing or what was not going on with this thing, I should really say. But it would be kind of neat to actually get one. Okay. Hope you liked the video. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.